Hi, welcome back to English 340. This is the first of what I think will be two lectures this week. The first is on Margaret Cavendish, the Duchess of Newcastle, um, an important author in English history and also, also a philosopher and scientific thinker, a kind of Renaissance woman, uh, and an interesting character all around. Um, so this, she's going to be the topic of this lecture. Uh, make sure that you go into the weekly folder and look for the handout. Each week there's a handout with a list of terminology um, that is somehow crucial or central to the themes, topics, or ideas that we are exploring that week. So without further ado, let's get in. Let's just talk a little bit about who Margaret Cavendish was. We're looking in particular today at just two of her poems and um, selections that are in the Norton Anthology of English Literature from her prose utopian romance, The Blazing World. Um, Margaret Cavendish was from the upper gentry. She was a maid of honor to Queen Henrietta Maria, who was the unfortunately beheaded Charles I's queen, and she followed the queen into exile in France in 1643. So this puts, this puts Margaret Cavendish right up in the um, upper tiers of society, just underneath the royalty. Um, her brother, was a royalist in the English Civil War, and when they lost, he was executed for treason. Uh, her husband was a royalist uh, general named William Cavendish, who lost the Battle of Marston Moor, but for his service to the crown was named the, the Duke of Newcastle. There had been no duchy of Newcastle before that, um, but he became the Duke after the restoration of Charles I in 1660. Some of the themes of her work include science, gender, and power, the imagination, political monarchism, and medicine. These are all interested things that she had an interest in. I'm going to uh, post one of the very strange scientific medical poems that she um, wrote called Nature's Cook. Um, she actively circulated her works with the press, and she was the first woman in England who wrote mainly for publication. Sorry, my recording was just... Uh, interrupted by a stupid uh, sales call on my phone, and I, I put it on silent now. Anyway, I was saying she was the first woman to actively circulate her works with the press. She was the first woman in England who wrote mainly for publication, and um, had the uh, ability to do so, and funded her own, the publication of her own works, as, as, as we will see. Um, the Blazing World is one of her most interesting works. It was published in 1666. And again in 1668, and each time it was published with um, uh, works by hers uh, called Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy. And she was a keen, uh, keenly interested in science, and this is the decade in which Isaac Newton was formulating his theories of physics, and Robert Boyle was coming up with uh, the theories that would be the foundation for the, the theories of how gas works and um, states of matter. And all kinds of stuff was going on. This is the uh, this is really where the rubber is hitting the road for the scientific revolution, and she's taking part of it. And one of the things that she's actually um, criticizing in her observations upon experimental philosophy, which I don't think is included in your in your anthology, um, is the uh, vivisection of living animals for scientific research. The word vivisection means to cut open an animal while it is still alive. She didn't like this, and this maybe um, fits with some of the themes in the hunting of the hare. And one of the things that I, I would ask about the hunting of the hare, I'm not going to go too deep into it, but it's an interesting and lively and original poem, um, and ask, is there a moral argument to this poem? What is it that she's trying to say about the traditional hunting um, uh, uh, parties of aristocratic England. And, and remember that when she's talking about hunting, and particularly the hunting of the hare, she's not talking about um, people living off the land and subsisting by hunting in the way that maybe you family might hunt for deer in the Ozarks or your ancestors um, here or, or somewhere else had to hunt to survive. Hunting in, in, in this period is this big sort of aristocratic sport. In fact, the word sport originally means hunting, where you had would have dozens and dozens of people with horses and dogs just chasing 
one little rabbit. It was an excuse to get out in your, in your fancy hunting outfits and with your fancy hunting gear and, and chase down a little bunny rabbit. Okay, maybe the uh, English hare that they hunted was slightly more formidable than that, but only slightly. Uh, and she's asking what all this was for. And one of the literary techniques, um, what literary techniques are used to advance this argument? And I, I, would, I would ask you to have a look at her point of view. If you're really interested in Cavendish, you can have a look at her, the true relationship of her birth, breeding, and life, where she thinks about the nature and purpose of literary authority. Um, and she brings up a term that I think is, is particularly useful and interesting, and that term is emulation. Um, in the true relation of my birth, breeding, and life, her autobiography, um, on page uh, 1890 in your Norton Anthology, she writes, I am a great emulator, for though I wish none worse than they are, yet it is lawful for me to wish myself the best, and to do my honest endeavor thereunto. For I think it no crime to wish myself the exactest of nature's works, my thread of life the longest, my chain of destiny the strongest my mind the peaceablest, my life the pleasantest, my death the easiest, and the greatest saint in heaven. Also, to do my endeavor, so far as honor and honesty doth allow of, to be the highest on fortune's wheel, and to hold the wheel from turning if I can, and if it be commendable, that is, um, approvable, to wish another's good, it were a sin not to wish my own, for as envy is a vice, so emulation is a virtue. But emulation is in the way to ambition, that might, you might say on the way, or indeed it is a noble ambition. Now, what she's saying here, she's saying, I don't think it's wrong to want to be the best, right? And the word emulate in modern English means to to imitate or to try to equal. But in early modern English, it um, is closer to its Latin root. Uh, the, the root is a, um, a noun, imulus. It's the masculine form, feminine, which she, Margaret Cavendish would be an imula. But an imulus is one who strives to equal, to vies with, to excel, a rival. And, and, and there's a verb that's made from that to be and an imulus this is a particular kind of verb that, that that's to, to act in the manner of. So to imulor, to strive to equal or excel, to vie with, emulate, or copy. Now, throughout Western literature and Western culture, this is a attitude and a... Um, a posture that is considered noble in men. Um, we can see it in, for example, Beowulf, who's, who wants to be the best, the most glorious, and who are uh, in competition with each other. We can see it in the sonneteers, in which the way they try to outdo each other in their, their sonneteering. We can see it in um, all, all, man all kinds of manifestations of masculine culture. Um, we could see it in the way that writers attempt to outdo one another, Chaucer to Dante and Shakespeare to Chaucer, and, and as we will see, Milton to everyone ever. Um, but it's not a customary position. It's not a customary attitude to see a woman in. This here is the frontispiece, a, an etching, an inscription that she had commissioned for the inside book plate of the book that she funded the publication of herself that incl in, um, included The Blazing World and other works of hers. And I, I just love the the kind of like Beyonce style, like self-aggrandizement that's going on here as she puts herself literally on a pedestal dressed in these imperial robes with, with the hip out and the elbow there and these guards looking on like, wow, she's awesome, check her out. There's, there's Apollo you know, the god of the sun with the laurel wreath on holding a, a hearth. And there's, there's uh, I guess that's Min maybe that's Minerva, the goddess of wisdom. Uh, no, that's Perseus because he's got the shield with the Medusa on there. But they're all checking her out. And she's just like, yeah, look at me. I'm awesome. That's right. I'll emulate you. 
And so Cavendish is kind of a singular figure, and she was thought by critics of her time and of the 18th century to be a slightly absurd figure. Um, because, you know, who is this woman writing on science and philosophy um, and also writing this crazy story called The Blazing World? Um, but in the 20th century, and obviously in the 21st, she's somebody who we paid a lot more attention to because she is a shockingly original poet and writer. In some ways, you know, um, we might call her not just the first female science fiction author, but the first science fiction author. Um, why is science important to Cavendish? Well, um, one of the things about it, it is that her brother's a scientist too, and she comes from a family that was that was full of intellectuals who were all sort of talking with each other and working together. And um, her her work, Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy, was a work that propounded a, a, a scientific view called vitalism, which believed that there was a, something inherent to life that that made a living matter different than um, dead or mechanical matter. And it, this wasn't necessarily spirit. It was something that was inherent in material, but there was a kind of material life force that animated living things. And this is a point of view that... Um, was debated into the 19th century. Um, vitalism didn't go away. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. I mean, it wasn't. It was only in the the 19th and 20th century that that mechanism, the view that the same sort of laws of physics and and movement and matter govern living things as govern un unliving, inanimate um, things, if you will. So she, um, Goethe, the German poet, was a, was a vitalist, and, and so were various, uh, Bergson, the philosopher. Been, vitalism continued on. I think Nietzsche was a vitalist, too. Um, so in any case, she, she was um, uh, an original and um, a pretty thorough, systematic, and careful thinker about science, but she was an adherent to a scientific point of view on biology in particular, which... Um, subsequently lost favor and was disproved by modern molecular, bio, biomolecular science and stuff like that. So she was keenly interested in science and um, science the, and the, uh, the idea of atoms and particles and, and all kinds of things, which were still theoretical at this point, animate the text called The Blazing World. Now, we call it a work of science fiction. We might also call it a prose utopian ro romance. It's prose, and it's utopian because it depicts an ideal society. And it's a romance because it depicts an adventure. Um, a noble earth woman finds her way into an alternative world, which is the home to various hybrid species, where she meets and marries the emperor and rules virtuously. Then, at the end, she is introduced by spirit... Well, at, at some point, she's introduced subsequently um, by spiritual or like psychic means to a character who is the Duchess of Newcastle, Cavendish herself. And they have a... Over the uh, makeup and the constitution of the society and how it's organized. Um, and Margaret uh, finally says that she wishes for a world of her own to rule. And this um, empress grants it. This, uh, and so, in some ways, Margaret Cavendish, yeah, she could, she's the original science fiction writer. She's also kind of the original, um, what, what fan fiction writers call Mary Sue, where you sort of write yourself into the um, uh, story as like a, like a glorious, perfect kind of person. Although, you know, I mean, you look at Dante, and he writes himself into uh, the, the Divine Comedy, and he gets to like go before the throne room of God, and meet Jesus, and so that's that's pretty Mary Sueish, uh, Marty Stew, I guess is the term when it's a boy. Anyway, um, the Blazing World's an interesting place. Um, Cavendish's protagonist, the Empress, is a benign despot. She's ruling a society in which rebellion is not only prohibited but unimaginable. No one in this world can desire to alter their social station because they, be they, because the, the there are, bear, there are people who are bear men, um, worm men, spider men, and they're all programmed for a particular social 
function. Each quote follows such a profession as was most proper for the nature of their species. And so it's a vision of a perfectly organized world where every part of society is sort of like biologically tuned to it, which, I mean, almost might strike us as being dystopian in some ways, but, um, but not for Margaret Cavendish. She is, among other things, I mean, in, in politics, she is a royalist, I mean, a serious royalist. She, of course, was um, grew up in the upper aristocracy and was a late lady in waiting to the royal family when they went into exile. And then, and she watched, she grew up during the sort of traumatic events of the English Civil War and the social upheaval of the, 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 uh, the Republic and the Protectorate and all that. And so, you know, coming back and seeing the king established, she's deeply committed to the idea of kingship as necessary to maintaining um, order in society. She is a serious and principled monarchist, which is a weird thing for us to think about as Americans in the 21st century, that that's like some, that like a political philosophy that people would sincerely hold to. But there it is. Um, she's, her attitudes towards women are interesting because she's kind of dismissive of the ambitions of women, but not of her own. <laughs> she's, you know, she's, um, and she represents herself, well, first you can see how she represents herself here, but I mean, for example, in, in the, um, in the, uh, when she's asking, um, at the very end of the blazing world, when she's talking about what she'd like to be and why she's writing and why she wants to create her own world through writing, she writes that though I cannot be Henry V or Charles II, yet I will endeavor to be Margaret the First. And though I have neither power, time, nor occasion to be a great conqueror like Alexander or Caesar, yet rather not be mistress of a world, since fortune and the fates would give me none, I have made one of my own. And thus, believing, or at least hoping, that no creature can or will envy me for this world of mine, I remain Noble ladies, your humble servant, Margaret Newcastle. How interesting. That if you want to paraphrase this, she's saying, well, I don't have the power or the ability to be a great conqueror or world leader, so I'm just going to make up my own world. Now, one could view this as a kind of um, neurotic escapism, right? And this is sort of, um, you know, we're into the early modern here, and we can see this kind of... Um, this grappling with the with one's inability to to achieve the kind of significance they would hope for in their life through an escape into a uh, fantasy or a virtual or simulated world um, as very symptomatic in some ways of the the modern and even the postmodern condition. But here she is exploring it in a very premature way, or or not premature, but um, early. Uh, avant-garde is, is another way to say it that way. Um, and this, you know, she's just, just a fashion, fascinating figure. And the blazing world is worth more of our time if we had it. Um, it is, um, but, it, but it's also an interesting commentary on authorship and what authorship is for and why people write. This isn't um, on the one hand, she is emulous, right? She's, she, she is emulating. She wants to rival other writers. She wants to take on people's ideas and identities. And, and on the other hand, there's a kind of retreating from um, competition that she isn't allowed to take part in because she knows she's disqualified as a woman. Uh, in a room, um, in a, an essay, Virginia Woolf, uh, one of the great women writers of the 20, one of the great writers of the 20, 20th century, uh, says, though her philosophies are futile, <laughs> so kind of point, and her plays intolerable, and her verse is mainly dull, the vast bulk of the Duchess is leavened by a vein of authentic fire. Virginia Woolf, The Common Reader, 1925. Now, I am going to... When Virginia Woolf says that her verses are mainly dull, she's echoing the kind of um, the critical consensus of mostly male critics from the 18th century on. But I take issue with this. Um, Margaret Cavendish writes really interesting and provocative and bizarre verses. 
have a look at this um, poem that's not in your um, anthology, but worth looking at as characteristic of the the, the strangeness and originality of of Margaret Cavendish, who wrote this, I believe, when she was. Hold on a second. When was she born again? 1623. Okay, so she's about in her mid 20s. Nature's cook. Death is the cook of nature, and we find meat dressed several ways to please her mind. Some meats she roasts with fevers burning hot, and some she boils with dropsies in a pot. Some for jelly consuming by degrees, and some with ulcers gravy out to squeeze. Some flesh as sage she stuffs with gouts and pains. Others for tender meat hangs up in chains. Some in the sea she pickles up to keep. Others as brawn as soused those in wine steep. Some with the pox chops flesh and bones so small of which she makes a French fricassee withal. Some on gridirons of calendars is broiled as a torture instrument, and some is trodden on and so quite spoiled. But those are baked when smothered they do die. By hectic fevers some meat she doth fry, in sweat sometimes she stews with savoury smell. A hodgepodge of diseases tasteth well, brains dressed with apoplexy to nature's wish, or swims with sauce of megrims in a dish. Megrims is migraines. And tongues she dries with smoke from Stokmax ill. Stomach's ill, I think I mistyped that. Which as the second course she sends up still. Yeah. Then death cuts throats for blood puddings to make, and puts them in the guts which colics rack. Some hunted are by death for deer that's red or stall-fed oxen and knocked on the head. Some for bacon by death are singed or scaled, then powdered up with phlegm and hroom that's salt. Maybe that should be scalt. Anyway, you can imagine an 18th century uh, critic who believes in sort of proportion and beauty and order looking at this and going, what the heck? But there is a, an intense, um, there's a powerful imagery in this, and there's a kind of grotesquerie that I think really would not be out of place in 20th century po poetry, um, and uh, a focus on material being, which of course takes us very much away from Neoplatonism, but she's a woman who really believes that, that life inheres in our physicality, right? It's part of her vitalist philosophy. And um, this is just an interesting way that her different sensibilities, her interest in in science, in medicine, in poetry, um, and in human experience all come together to make a, a poem that in a lot of ways is maybe more memorable than a lot of other Renaissance poetry. So that's Margaret Cavendish for you. There she is looking out at you saying, um, well, what is she saying? Dialogue with one another. Here's the text at the foot of her pedestal. Here on this figure cast a glance, but so as if it were by chance, your eyes not fixed, they must not stay, since this, like shadows to the day, it only represents. For still, her beauty's found beyond the skill of the best painter to embrace, those lovely lines within her face. View her soul's picture, judgment's wit, then read those lines which she hath writ by fancy's pencil drawn alone, which peace but she can justly own.